structure of the lectures as presentations. So first one about methodology, then one about uh, the phonetic meaning of the Chinese uh, script, like what, what phonology is inside the Chinese script, which is uh, using my technical jargon, you know, Shisheng connections as transposers, and then using Middle Chinese, which you just sort of get off the shelf as the imposer, right? So now I'm going to actually go through in the way I sort of promised to imposers in chronological order. So we start with cognates and early loans. Uh, cognates and early loans. So in chronological order of the availability of the, you know, the, the source in question, we have trans Himalayan cognates. So things like Tibetan, Burmese, you know, Jarong, Sino Tibetan languages, or trans Himalayan languages, if you like. Uh, then we have uh, loans used by Max and Cigar. I'm going to present uh, those are. Uh, at least what they presume to be, and I think they're generally right, old Chinese loans into other Asian languages, for instance, into Vietic languages or into Hmong Hien, so on. Yeah. Uh, then I'll mention some loans uh, not mentioned by them. Uh, and so now let's, uh, let's do it. Okay, so one methodological question is, is it appropriate to use cognates in other languages to, uh, to reconstruct uh, old Chinese. So, I mean, I'll just give you an example. Uh, uh, the word feminine, sorry, the word uh, woman, uh, which we've seen, where did my pen go? Uh, new. Christopher Beckwith, I think, reconstructs as way not okay and you kind of well like let, let me ask you uh can you tell something about christopher beckwith's ideas of the external relations of chinese what do you mean to do this? <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so uh so i think there's this there's this risk that is a genuine risk of, let's call it overfitting, right? Which is that like, if you think, you know, uh, Chinese is an Indo-European language, then you will want the word for woman to be buena, yeah? Um, and, and because the evidence is scanty and ambiguous and whatnot, it may be the case that, uh, you know, a strong case can be made <laughs> that the, 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 the uh, old the old Chinese word for a woman is guena, uh, but I th I think we see that, that this is a dangerous uh, uh, risk. This kind of overfitting. So some people would say, no, we shouldn't look at external cognates at all. Right? We should only reconstruct Chinese based on Chinese evidence. So uh, that's an opinion. Uh, but I think it's fine to take inspiration from cognates. Right? Like, like uh, in, in, in a sense, you know, if I can argue on the basis of Chinese evidence alone that the old Chinese uh, word for uh, woman was Guena, then that, well, then that will be an interesting finding, right? And we'll have to scrutinize my moves very carefully. Uh, but uh, I think if, if it turns out that the, I mean, here we can sort of agree with Popper, right? We can find our hypothesis wherever we want. We can do drugs. We can, you know, uh, throw darts at uh, the wall or something. Uh, if we can then make a good case for it based on Chinese internal evidence, uh, then maybe it was okay. Turns out it would have been okay. Yeah? Uh, but the other thing I would say is, um, yeah, so I, what, what, what I don't think we should do is we shouldn't let cognates change our overall uh, idea of the phonology or the phonetic tactics, right? If there's some distinction like between final R and final L that you can say, well, Chinese has final J where Tibetan has final L and final R, for example, then it would be wrong to reconstruct the distinction in Chinese based on the Tibetan evidence alone, right? We shouldn't add new distinctions using external evidence. Uh, so that's my feeling, you know, take some inspiration from looking around, but don't add new distinctions 
uh, using external evidence. But what you can do is if there's a distinction you've already made, but, but because of, let's say, conditioned mergers in the history of Chinese, you can't tell based on Chinese evidence alone what the Chinese reconstruction should be. I think it's fine to go with the version that makes external comparisons look better, right? Um, imagine that uh, you know, we're, we're uh, talking about, let's say, uh, Sanskrit, right? So, so we know Sanskrit collapses E and O and, and A. Uh, so uh, proposing that at some uh, moment in the history of you know, Indo-Aryan or something, that there's an E based on Greek evidence, that's fine, right? Yeah. Like, so I think that's, that's where external evidence can be uh, used is to, is to resolve ambiguities in the, in the reconstruction where, uh, but, but not adding new, now, I, now I'm realizing there's all sorts of problems with my comparison with, with it would be something like, and I don't know if this is the case. Uh, in principle, you can tell in Proto-Indo-Aryan whether, whether Proto-Indo-Aryan had E, A, or O based on the comparison of just Avestan and Sanskrit. Like, is that the case? I don't know, you tell me. Uh, but then suppose for a certain word, there isn't an Avestan cognate, yeah? Well, then why not go look at what Greek has, yeah? And then it would still, I think that would be justifiable, yeah? Okay. Um, so uh, now I'm going to make distinctions that can on the basis of Chinese evidence be proven to have existed. But yeah, exactly. A certain word, no, no. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I, I mean, I'm thinking of one thing in particular, which is uh, medial R. So, um, they, I'm not, and I actually don't know the phonology well enough to really say this, but uh, let's say I think this is right. That let's say pa and pra can be distinguished very clearly. Yeah. But that, uh, let's say, kra and ka can't, that they merge. Yeah. So, so if you, if, 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 if there's a given word, so the way Baxter and Cigar write that is with the R in parentheses to say, look, in this phonological environment, the kra and ka merge. So we don't know whether it had a medial R. I would say, well, look, if, the, if Tibetan has a medial R, just go with that, right? Because you, you, you're not actually adding any information to it in a sense. That possibility is already there. Yeah, it's, it's, you can think of it almost as just a typographical cleanup, yeah? But uh, the first thing I'm going to say, it has to do with um, something that Baxter and Cigar don't propose, which uh, comes back to something we were talking about yesterday, which are, what are the sources of retroflexion uh, or of, uh, of certain kind of vowel pronunciation too? So I discussed medial R, but uh, some people, including me, think maybe a prefix R was also a, a source of uh, retroflexion. Uh, so Zhang um, Shuya, Guillaume Jock, and I think Lai Yufan wrote this article uh, comparing um, Gyaron cognates with Old Chinese, and they argue uh, that 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 from a hip trans Himalayan perspective, uh, we should posit a, uh, a, a pre-initial, if you like, R, and that that is one source of reflection in uh, Chinese. And it's not their idea. It goes back to pulling blank in Poblin. Uh, lots of people have sort of thought about this. So here are cases of uh, CR. So we have uh, in old Chinese to descend uh, with uh, and then uh, the Japuk cognate is Ngra. So uh, we can say that the R has been, the, the place of the R as a medial in Old Chinese has been confirmed by looking at the Japuk cognate. Right? Uh, and then here's another one. So this is a uh, claw where Sidu Chungse has Ngru. So again, it seems to confer, sorry, confirm the medial R. Yeah? Uh, and then here's another one. This one is to defeat, uh, which maybe is coming to this, uh, to break in Situ uh, Again, uh, it confirms the R. Yeah, so, uh, but there are cases instead 
where uh, the Aurora point is point the R being a foreman. So I fill with these old Chinese reconstructions. Back in the cigar, we're here reconstructing from, uh, but I think let's reconstruct from uh, because uh, here Sifu Chokse has from. Yeah. What is uh, it's a language. Uh, <laughs> no, okay. Can you say like two, eight words more about it? It's, uh, it's in Sichuan. Yeah. So it's a Gyaronic language. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and C and C2 is there's a bunch of C2s. Yeah. So C2 is the is the kind of biggest, let's call it dialect continuum in uh, the Gyaron area. I think this is, you know, the Gyaronists out there will. Well, maybe uh, tell me I'm wrong about this, but like chop book, uh, cross chop, these are kind of relatively small, uh, geographically distinct uh, Gyaron varieties, whereas uh, C2 kind of is like Germanic or something, you know. So then there's various types. There's a uh, there's a uh, uh, bar C2 and Chokse C2 and, and whatnot. Yeah. Okay, and then here's um, uh, eyebrow. So chop uh, uh, has this to meh. So uh, I think maybe the R is also uh, at the beginning in old Chinese. Uh, and then we have uh, face. Uh, so uh, here again, uh, uh, I try to use Jokbook because, you know, Guillaume Jacques has been working on Jokbook so much that I think it's kind of the best known Yalong language. Uh, so when there was a Jokbook cognate, I only give that one. Uh, but when there was not, then I did one of the other languages. Um, these are all from their article, yeah. And then uh, in this case, uh, to steal or to rob, I put this one in parentheses because, again, it's the you, you can't tell whether, on, based on Chinese, whether it had it at all, yeah. But here I'm arguing if it had the R, <laughs> it should be at the beginning rather than <laughs> in the medial uh, in order to improve the comparison. Uh, with Tibetan of Fu and Japo Mukku. And, and, and for the other cases, that Bexan Sagar have R's too. For all, I mean, for all three. In, uh, I think so, but I would have to double check, which is I'm sometimes a little sloppy about uh, um, all of their conventions because they have, they have lots of, they have parentheses, they have brackets, they have pointing brackets, which are all telling you kind of their emotional relationship with uh, their reconstruction. Like, oh, in this case, it might be this, or it might be something else, or in this case, it could be there or not there. And, and personally, I feel like uh, I prefer sort of put our cards on the table and say, I think this is it, right? Because uh, partly, I think for the philosophical reason that no reconstruction is secure, right? So I, I think like, you know, you should love your children and, they should say, no, I, I think it is an, an R, and that's why I wrote an R there, right? No, well, yeah. yeah. Another question related to this. Are these syllables where uh, the effects of the medial are to be seen or not? Uh, Does it have which effect on So that is, uh, so, so I'm going to say for per current purposes, uh, if it's not in parentheses, then it would have an effect. And if it is in parentheses, then it wouldn't have an effect. Uh, but if you know if you were going to torture me if I was wrong or something, I would want to double check them, right? No, no. Well, okay. yeah. Third question related. Yeah. So red reflection with the preceding R or medial R. That's I think. Uh, well, we would be very happy. But uh, some kind of uh, vowel effect from preceding R that would be a little bit uh, weird. Would be weird, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point, and uh, I will keep that in mind. In these cases, uh, yeah, it's the AE is the is the vowel effect. Yeah, I was suspecting. Yeah, yeah, but there is actually something. So uh, I think it's only in actually I think in the, I think here too it would have been uh, something else if it. If they weren't, and and then would it become whom or well, uh, no, I think it well it becomes thing right there it is. 
uh, yeah, but it's uh, these ings, I think, would be um or something if the R hadn't been. Right? Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, the yeah. vowel would have been different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think in, yes, now that I look at them carefully, in all three, I can tell you that the vowel would have been different if the R hadn't been. Uh, and your perhaps uh, the R was originally initial and then it swapped for something to, to get the vowel. Well, maybe I don't know. I mean, I, like, I, if you would just want to say, look, no, don't use C two, uh, you know, don't don't use Jarong to move your R's around in in cases where it affects the vowel. I think that, that that's a, that's a very sensible suggestion. Yeah, um, but I would also be yeah okay with kind of. I mean, the way I would do it is sort of say at some point retroflexion. Sorry, the the what is it? Roticity of it was a syllable of the is a feature of the syllable. That's I I think basically at a certain point in the in in Chinese historical phonology, kind of a lot of stuff should be like A B distinction should be seen as having at the whole syllable level. So we can sort of say um, you know plus A minus A if you want, yeah, to to make the A B distinction, and then you could say sort of plus R minus R something like that. This is an approach that that I think people have been using with Tonga recently. And I don't know. And then it's a question of, are you comfortable with formulating things in that way? That has to do with sort of how you feel about phonology in general, right? Uh, which is, I think is a good question, a good point that, that a, a pre-initial, we might expect to affect vowels less than a medial. Uh, uh, okay, so but just uh, plugging along, here we have a uh, shell in uh, Chinese and bark. In C to Chose, and then I'll say that the, the, the missing final K is a, is a problem, but it's a problem in Java. It's not a problem in Chinese. Uh, okay, so yeah, and then uh, here are examples where uh, Chinese is ambiguous, but I think the, the external cognates can uh, make us think that uh, there was no media. So here we have a uh, mother's brother, so some kind of uncle, yeah? And uh, gu would look better than guru uh, for comparing with aku in Tibetan or aku in Sikhi uh, yeah. so, so is this clear? In this case, Baxter and Cigar countenance the reconstruction of an R, although they don't propose it. Uh, and I would say, eh, Based on these external cognates, let's not reconstruct an R there. I mean, I would basically actually say if if we're never sure whether, like, if in any instance where it's ambiguous between something being there and not being there, the default should be to not being there. Just that's my aesthetic. But uh, you know, anyhow, uh, and then here is bend. Uh, so again, you know, the job doesn't have uh, an R. Uh, and then here's belly. Uh, so I think puk compared, compared very nicely with puk in Tibetan and pok in Sipu uh, Chokse, but prk would not compare quite as nicely. Okay, so that was it for using external cognates to move R's around or to delete them. And now let's look at uh, how lungs are used by Baxter and Cigar. Uh, so starting with Vietnamese languages, okay. So uh, other than Vietnamese, these languages are all really undocumented and understudied. So if any of you don't know what to do with your lives, let me encourage you to work on documenting, you know, uh, endangered Vietnamese languages. There's, you know, maybe between a half dozen and a dozen of them. Uh, and they're all really locally under studied. Uh, so uh, they use the uh, pre initial K in Boro to, uh, to reconstruct this K here. So they think the old Chinese word for bed uh, had a K. And basically, the argument is and it's, it's very simple is it a coincidence that Malang and Boro have a word? for bed, and that the old Chinese uh, word for bed is at least zrong. Probably not, right? It's probably 
some kind of loan relationship and all good things come from China. So it must be that the, the four Malang bro got their beds from, uh, you know, from the central kingdom. Uh, but then how do we explain the presence of this cup, right? Well, you could say, oh, they added it. It's some kind of noun classifier or something like that. But uh, Baxter and Cigar say, well, maybe it was already in the loan. Yeah? That's their approach to uh, looking for evidence of uh, initials, complicated initials in uh, these languages. Yeah? And I, as far as I know, these examples are exhaustive, which is to say Baxter and Cigar only use this one piece of data from Brawl to reconstruct this 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 K in this one example, yeah, as far as I know. Yeah. So then in uh, such they use it for in two cases. Uh, so again, bed, so actually it's sort of strengthening our our hypothesis in bed had a K initial, and then also in land. Yeah. Okay. So I will uh, so and then in Pong, uh, what's also K's, so in the word for hammer. And in the word for meat, uh, and in uh, maling kapong, and apparently this maling is is different than the earlier one. I don't know anything about the other languages, but um, so in this case, it's uh, again that. So I think you know, let's say there we can at least say that lots of Vietic minority languages have some kind of k initial word for bed. Uh, that's similar otherwise to Chinese books. Uh, oops, 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 where did I? Okay, so we just take this one and then here, uh, so chopsticks and slips for drilling. So uh, I don't know why this is the sort of thing that they don't, they don't say very much about this. But so here they say there is some prefix, but they don't actually reconstruct it as a T, even though they give as evidence of there being a prefix this T form in, um, in Malang Kapong. And then I, I don't know, why don't they reconstruct it as a T? Do they know something about the historical phonology of uh, Malang Kapong? I don't know, you have to ask them. Oh, that's, uh, that's what I just said here in the slide. Okay, uh, and then uh, they most rely on Rook, which is a very interesting language. Uh, and I, there's no need for me to, you know, talk through all the forms. But in any case, these are uh, the examples from Rook, where they think there's a loan from Chinese that in Rook has a K prefix, uh, and that probably Rook got that from uh, there being a K prefix in all Chinese. Uh, and then so far, I've only shown you K prefixes, uh, and so let's show you some T prefixes as well. Uh, these ones again from Rook. Um, and Baxter and Cigar take pre initial T in Rook to suggest initial uh, pre initial S. And they point out that Rook lacks pre initial S. So they basically think, you know, Chinese had uh, what scrums for sword, and then that was borrowed as in Rook. But I don't, I don't know, like, I, I understand that that's possible, you know, if you don't have a, a pre-initial a pre S, you might borrow pre-initial S as a T, but it would also work if you borrowed a pre-initial T as a T, right? Uh, so I'm not sure why they resist the urge to, uh, to, to recon, because they, they showed no similar hesitation, you know, with the Ks and the Ts we've seen so far. Uh, I, I presume that there are, you know, uh, other theory internal reasons that they want these to be guesses. Pre-initial T exists in their system. Yeah, we haven't seen any pre-initial T's, but uh, they do exist in their system. Right? Yeah. So, um, so that's not why they're hesitating. Uh, and then we also get pre-initial M uh, in Rook. Okay, that was it for the minority languages of Vietnam. And now on to Vietnamese. Vietnamese doesn't preserve these nice uh, constant clusters, so that's sad. Yeah? Uh, but they do preserve R and L. Uh, and Baxter and Cigar uh, take 
spiritization in Vietnamese as evidence for an erstwhile pre-initial. Yeah? And that's the main thing that we will look at. Okay, so first of all, there's R and L, and we've looked at R's and L's before, right? And so hopefully this will start to make you feel a little better. Uh, so, uh, so R in Old Chinese becomes L in Middle Chinese, and you can, yeah, you can start to convince yourself of that by looking at these examples. So we have, you know, we have yeah in uh, Middle Chinese that H should have been large, um, and then uh, that goes back to Rai in uh, Old Chinese, and you see it's Rai in Vietnamese, so it's very similar. Uh, so yeah, they confirm R R's, and then here they can Vietnamese confirm L, where in Middle Chinese we have initial ya. You remember this, that in type B syllables, L's become ya's, uh, and then Vietnamese confirms the L. So uh, I think this is I don't know, quite this is solid, right? That um, the proposal I offered yesterday about reconstructing R and L really do feel like they're being uh, backed up here by uh, Vietnamese. Okay, and now uh, one thing that is an issue here is Vietnamese orthography. Uh, so whenever the uh, letter in Vietnamese seems sufficiently distant from what it's representing in IPA, I give it, uh, and also there's North Vietnamese and South, South Vietnamese can be different, so I give it in South Vietnamese, and this is all following Baxter and Cigar, right? Uh, but so the point here is they're spherentized, so it's a it's a it's a fricative, uh, and they see that as evidence that uh, it, there was some pre-initial, right? That basically uh, Vietnamese loses the pre-initial, but the the former presence of the pre-initials is still uh, indexed by the fact that uh, that um, Vietnamese has spherentized, and and Vietnamese does this. Of course, in inherited vocabulary, what language family is Vietnamese in? Austroasiatic, is that right? Uh, uh, so inherited vocabulary in Vietnamese, uh, these pre-initials are become spiritization. So they think the same thing happened. Basically, the loans were early enough that they had the constant clusters, and then the loans also spiritized when the constant clusters were lost. So in any case, and that happens when there is a goal. Their uh, reconstruction. Uh, there, so the dot you can understand as a schwa. Yeah, that was actually the background of my question. So you would like this B is becoming? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, maybe it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they, I forget exactly, but I think they put a dot when they think the tree initial has a morphological meaning and. Uh, but I forget. Actually. Isn't there also something with, with more closely attached? Yeah, no, they, they have they have loosely attached, closely attached, loosely attached. But closely attached means without a schwa, and loosely attached means with yeah, a schwa. Okay. Um, that makes more sense. So uh, yeah, okay. So and then uh, in this case, uh, they it's it's before a key, right? Uh, and then. Uh, here uh, in IP syllables and so on. You know, I, I don't want to sort of, it's, it's, it's all right, I find it a hard balance. Like I don't want to just sort of say, oh, look, there's lots of evidence. On the other hand, it would be very tedious if we went through every single example, right? Uh, so in any case, you can see that there's, uh, here it is a sub, so uh, it's spherentized in Vietnamese. Um, now, why does Vietnamese distinguish, this is a genuine question on my part, uh, type A before, you know, type A and type B here, uh, but not that, like before T, but not before it. So, yeah, you just notice that. Here it is, so, and there's uh, like, there's a B example, there's an A example, uh, but, uh, uh, whoops, that's, with the T's, we get a different development in A and B. I think that's weird. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So let's go through this. Uh, in, let's make sure I'm starting at the right place. So 
capital C T in type A syllables becomes a Z. Yeah. And capital T in well, yeah. So the thing is, notice that the Vietnamese spelling is different. Yeah. So so here the Vietnamese has a D, and here the Vietnamese has a GI. Now they both pronounce Z in southern Vietnamese, but that's a recent development. So in any case, they and in, in both cases they spirantize. So, like, yeah, they spirantize, but 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 their behavior is different. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I presume, but this is in the uh, Vietnamese historical analogy, but I presume this one was like the. And then it's a the. I read it somewhere. So I think this one was a the, and then this one. Well, I don't know. It's not going to be a gamma because gamma is G, but it's it's it's. I think it's a palatal, like a like or something. Yeah. So in any case, there's this distinction that uh, C T in type B syllables is J, and in type A syllables is the, and like that. You know, I don't know. I, I'm just saying like that's something that I noticed when I was reading the book, and and it seems. Like it's, I mean, it doesn't really affect their reconstruction system or anything, but it seems worth noting that, that somehow capitals, you know, like a, 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 an, a cluster before a T in their, its development in Vietnamese behave differently in type A and type B syllables, but a cluster before TF didn't do that. Um, yeah. And uh, the that's, what did I say? Oh yeah. So so I also point out that this means that like whatever the A B distinction was at the time that these barns happened to Vietnamese, it was salient enough that it was borrowed as some difference in Vietnamese, right? I think that's also very interesting and can kind of give us some sort of uh, evidence, kind of more evidence into how is how was type A and type B syllables different uh, at that time? Yeah. Uh, okay, so we, we do that. May I ask? Yeah. Is there a difference? Um, because you, you asked how that is there a difference? Why is there a difference? So, so, yeah. But does so make a difference in A and B type syllables in Chinese in general? In Chinese in general, like, like would so develop the same in A and B syllables? I think it would. In okay. general, yeah. Then why are we expecting the release of the production? It's not that, let's say, uh, the only reason why I compared the development of the with the development of the is because that seems natural, right? Like, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but let's actually just make it about the right? Like, uh, yeah, they, they it palatalizes. Yeah, okay, so it palatalizes. Um, but like, there's all sorts of things. Like, like I mean, for instance, L's change into D in type A syllables and Y in type B syllables, but they both end up as L in, in Vietnamese, right? So I would say this is the only case we've seen Vietnamese keeping track of uh, the type A, B distinction. And, that's, and so I think, um, you know, maybe I overplayed the contrast between the T and the T. Uh, but it's more like uh, it with initial ta, uh, Vietnamese is keeping track of uh, type A versus type B, uh, which shows you that what well, which gives us information both about the dating of the of the existence of the co contrast and about um, what its phonetics would have been at that time. Right? I do have a question for um, the gamma. Uh, and Vietnamese. Yeah. And at this slide, I see different uh, pre initials being proposed. We, we, we can have an S, we can have an M. I just kind of get confused um, if you know we have other evidence uh, that sort of supports we have different pre initials or you know how do we get the difference? Yeah, that's that's uh, you're exactly right. Those differences come from other evidence. Right from from Viet, the, the only thing Vietnamese tells you is there was some pre initial or there was not. So if Baxter cigar like if in these reconstructions 
they there is an S or a T or a K or whatnot, it's because there's other evidence they're bringing to bear. And and you know, in a sense, maybe to stick with a kind of heuristic thing, I should have reconstructed them all as capital C. But I thought, well, I might as well show you their actual reconstructions in this in this case. Yeah. Could the pre-initials in the Vedic languages, like a later development, like across all the Vedic uh, Vedic languages, instead of uh, a trace, you know, when the when the word is being borrowed into language is loaned into language from Old Chinese, could it be like developed individually, like later, just within that language family? Uh, certainly, if it had some morphological meaning in in Vedic, right? Like if if I don't know, if let's say the bed example, if uh, in Rook, all furniture starts with initial K, you know, <laughs> maybe they, they put a K prefix onto the borrowed word for bed, you know, these things happen in the world. The trouble is, mm -hmm. there's like, there's like two short articles about Rook, yeah, so this is where I think we really need, uh, in order, you know, like, you know, not to mention that these languages are worth studying their own rights. <laughs> uh, but for reconstructing old Chinese, we really need better documentation and better study of the minority languages of Vietnam. Yeah. So now, uh, just picking up from there, uh, Ra is interesting. And this is a little bit, uh, again, because of the orthography in Vietnamese, uh, it's kind of tricky to follow, if you like, I think. Uh, because you say, oh, well, uh, what's going on? Like, R doesn't look like a spirantized S, yeah? Um, but, but Z does, yeah, maybe. Uh, so in any case, they take uh, the correspondence between an S in Middle Chinese and an R in Vietnamese, which is pronounced as a Z in um, in Hanoi, uh, they see that as evidence of a uh, lost prefix before an S. And you can understand uh, the logic behind it because something must have, in this case, let's, let, if we just go with the modern uh, Vietnamese pronunciation, something must have voiced the S. So that kind of factor uh, would be this, um, this lost prefix. Now, I don't know anything about Vietnamese historical chronology, or I mean, I don't know any more than you basically see here. I did check some handbooks and whatnot when I uh, wrote my book. Uh, but I think, you know, it would be maybe worth asking, what's the history of this R in uh, Vietnamese? But in any case, now I've told you that they, um, that they uh, say this. Uh, and then also, apparently, the in inherit inherited, uh, Vocabulary, uh, sort of, yeah, I don't know, something like, uh, also develops as uh, into this R, which is pronounced as a Z. Okay, so uh, yeah, doesn't this show us that pre initials have a vowel, right? Because the Vietnamese law, uh, integral kind of English, right? That's what we see so far. And because otherwise, X, that's what we observe, right? Yeah. And this means that our pre initials, in fact, have vowels. Yes. That's pretty cool. Uh, that's, I mean, as was touched on last time, back in Scar actually distinguished tight pre initials from loose pre initials, and the loose pre initials had a vowel, and the tight pre initials they think wouldn't have a vowel. And uh, one kind of, um, it's not to blame them, but one sort of uh, thing that we can worry about from a neo grammarian perspective is is they see this uh, as basically a, a meaningless distinction, right? So uh, somewhere, I think it might be in his 1999 book, uh, Cigar said it sort of imagines that uh, a, a, a word, let's say it's, you know, uh, what was bed was something like uh, you know, uh, that each word would have two variants, you know, and actually, yeah. Uh, and, you know, as we, from a neo grammarian perspective, you don't like that. You don't like schwas to just, you know, merrily come and go. Um, 
but uh, actually stuff like this does happen in Southeast Asia a fair bit. And then, you know, I, I think that the tools that we use in the business, except for the sound change and analogy, will work, uh, but it ends up being quite tricky, right? So, and then, uh, you know, it's tricky just in the analysis of modern languages uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, let alone, uh, you know, trying to look at uh, the 1200 BC. So, but I think that's uh, something we should look at, actually, uh, or, or, or just sort of always keep in the back of our mind that, that if these... Uh, schwas are coming and going, then uh, then that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, Yun Fan Lai actually has worked a little bit recently about thinking of um, kind of looking at what uh, the phonotactics of a kind of full Chinese syllable, uh, which is to say one with two vowels in it, uh, would have been, uh, and, and thereby potentially predicting kind of which uh, uh, of these tight versus uh, loose variants um, Happened. He, he did this in an article that just just came out, maybe in Diachronica about lenition, I think. Uh, and the the treatment of all Chinese is straight at the end uh, in a, in a quite sort of uh, off the cuff way. Uh, but I think it's a very promising um, approach that he outlines there. Anyhow, uh, okay. So then uh, we also have a, a V uh, for all for P in let's say. To put it precisely, a V in, in Vietnamese corresponding to a P in Middle Chinese, then we take back to a uh, cluster of something with a P in all Chinese. So um, that's, I think, the last uh, of our discussion of loanwords in Vietnamese. So now we move on to loanwords in Mang Mian. Okay, so uh, Mang Mian. Tobacco and cigar primarily used to posit nasal prefixes. Now they, if I, if I, I hope I remember the details right, they distinguish this capital N prefix, which is something that would take on the place of articulation of the following stop, uh, which has its meaning, uh, and then an N prefix which stays an M regardless of what comes after it. Uh, so, you know, uh, as a footnote, of course, these two would have been phonetically uh, indistinguishable before labials. Uh, so they make this distinction. You can't recover that distinction from Hmong Mian loans, but you can see, oh, there was something nasally happening here. Uh, so let's just look at these examples. Uh, we have, the uh, word for tree, where middle Chinese has a j, which would go back to a da, uh, but then uh, proto Hmong Yan has this n the, right? So uh, that looks like probably the da actually goes back to an n the, yeah? Uh, then we have a pillar where uh, Chinese, where Middle Chinese has a da, which would go back to a ja, uh, and then Hmong Mian has ja, so they think that the um, the old Chinese was actually probably ndra, right? Uh, this seems quite straightforward, right? Yeah, is everyone feeling okay with this? Yeah. So then, this first word is. Uh, Right, you know, so the possibly the J of the proto Mongolian. Yeah, now, uh, yeah, possibly, yeah. Uh, that's not something, it, the only thing I know about uh, AB distinction in, in Mongolian loans is that the, the Chinese velars in type A syllables come out as uvulars. Uh, so, uh, so that's just a fact about. Evidence of the type A B distinction in Hmong Mian, in, in Chinese loanwords in the pro of Hmong Mian. Uh, I don't know of anyone commenting about uh, what you just noticed. And so you know, that would make a good, I mean, you're unlikely to do the assignment, I suspect, but, uh, <laughs> but, but that would be a good paper for someone uh, to do is look at, uh, you know, explore this hypothesis further. Is, is, is type B? 
under certain conditions uh, reflected as palatalization in protein Okay, so then uh, what? Then, so then we have this heat. Uh, actually, here's an example that I was just talking about. So the type A syllable with a velar in all Chinese, and then it comes out of the uvula in protein uh, But that's not the point here. The point is this not this, which I'm definitely not going to try and pronounce. Because uh, it's uvular or not. Uh, but so here, you know, uh, the, the kind of first pass in Old Chinese would be uh, and then we think that uh, it probably ultimately is from grut. I, I, yeah, you, 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 you're not getting the, the K here, I mean the Q. You would expect the Q here from this reconstruction. Uh, and I think the, the reason that they don't stop here is probably a morphological argument. Uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, we won't, we're only worried about Hmong uh, alone at the moment. Uh, and then yeah, the last one is uh, Justin. Uh, so, oh, yeah, so, so, Nja or Njao, yeah. Uh, and this Ndrak. So, uh, once again, you know, evidence of, of a nasal. Uh, the, the, uh, one thing I'll just say as a kind of user of their book, uh, they get these reconstructions from uh, Marta Rat Ratliff, who is the person who's reconstructing Brother Uh and, and her book, I don't find very usable as a non Hmong Yen specialist. Uh, so, uh, and, and then like the combination of personally not finding her book very usable, and then just using her reconstructions off the shelf starts to make me worried, right? Because like, um, because I'm not able to kind of intuitively, obviously verify that these reconstructions are correct. So then, you know, if if there's any possibility they're incorrect, then that would of course uh, mean that our use of them is also incorrect. So I mean, that hard to read. Is it as far as you can actually use it more convincing or no? It's just it's it's there's a tendency in uh, let's say I'll say in Tibeto Burman linguistics, but apparently also in Hmong Man linguistics, for me to have a book about historical chronology where I present a bunch of sound laws in like a ten-page essay right at the front, uh, and then just have a huge word list and uh, say sort of like, well. Those are my sound changes, and there's the evidence. Yeah, uh, and I don't find that easy to use. Yeah, uh, because then it's asking me to, you know, to <laughs> check, check each, each um, yeah, with, with yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and and yeah. I'm I'm slightly, you know, overplaying because they, they do have like index numbers, so it'll it'll be like you know, uh, P changes into F, C, 25, 63, 122. You know, but it's just not how I find uh, historical linguistics easy to read, let me put it that way. And, you know, in my book, uh, I sort of overdid it in, uh, in the other direction for this reason, which is every time I propose a sound change, I give all of the examples known to me, like right there on, on, in that paragraph, yeah. Um, because I would like it <laughs> as a reader if we moved more in that direction in, in Asian, uh, you know, historical linguistics. No, but it is quite worrying because the reconstruction is probably not well. It's probably not flawless, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and if you, you want to reach back to I know five hundred BC or where do you want to get with this? Uh, yeah, maybe let's system? let's say let's say five hundred BC, maybe a little bit before yeah. then. Even. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'll say that the thing that I like uh, to. to you know, to experience as a reader of historical linguistics is kind of a recipe is the way I talk about it, right? It's like, okay, I want to, I want to reconstruct Proto-Indo-European. So, you know, start with Sanskrit and then check the vowels in Greek and <laughs> check the original Hittite and basically there you go, right? Yeah, that's, that would be sort of my recipe for, for Indo-European and sometimes you wouldn't get, you know, all the way there with those three steps, um, but it certainly beats saying, you know, start with Albanian and then look at Welsh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so, uh, so that's that tradition isn't there in uh, in 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 Asian linguistics. We sort of love all our children equally. So, so you you sort of say, here's a sound change. It should be this in this language, and this in this language, and this in this language. Go look at the appendix. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so <laughs> that's um, you know I don't know that I, I didn't sort of intend to you know go on this uh, aside about the sort of working practices and discipline, but I do feel you know and uh, I don't know maybe maybe one shouldn't fetishize the achievements of uh, Indo-European linguistics, uh, but I do think that a certain amount of uh, practice it, it has been established. Uh, some of it good, maybe some of it bad, but but figuring out you know what's been helpful and what hasn't uh, is uh, I think it's very helpful to 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 gear ourselves towards the conventions of the wider discipline, right? And even things like which I also did in my book, paragraph numbers, I think is very nice, right? Because historical linguistics uh, writing is incredibly dense, <laughs> and so being able to refer to paragraph numbers. Is also really useful, and then actually another example of this kind of just you know while I'm rambling about scholarly conventions is the is the uh, index verborum right like this is another practice we don't have in Asian linguistics so it's just, so you know uh, where you know if if I'm working on Tibetan and I want to know like look for certain cognates in someone's book or something it's it's you know good luck. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and I, I can understand why every time you write about, you know, uh, Chinese, you don't want to compile a list of Burmese words that you happen to mention in passing, but it's an extremely useful practice. So um, anyhow, that's, an, that's enough sort of soapbox, but that's what I mean about uh, uh, her book being hard to use, yeah. And they ask, well, can we date these language contacts for the essay of yeah, I mean, uh, uh, sort of, I come unprepared to answer this question, which is uh, about the dating of uh, uh, contacts with different languages. Uh, but uh, Hmong Mian would be very early. Uh, the it's clear that let's say the the rightful owners of China are the Hmong Mian, yeah, um, and that the Chinese have been sort of pushing them uh, southeast. And their population has gotten, you know, isolated and scattered. If you just look at a map of where Mongolian is spoken, it's pretty clear that you know they've been there a long time. Yeah, uh, and then also in mythology, the kind of the other of early Chinese identity are the the Mongolian, I think. Yeah. Uh, it, so so they've been there a long time. Uh, and then uh, Vietic would be a little later. Yeah, but still quite early. Um, and let's, I mean, I don't know, think of it this way. Uh, I think in both cases before the Han Dynasty, right? And I think that's, you know, for, for my sort of rule of thumb purposes, a lot of things matter about, is it before the Han or is it after? Uh, okay. Yes, and then uh, another, place they find uh, evidence for nasals, uh, but with a slightly different, you know, uh, correspondence, which is why it has its own slide, uh, is uh, initial, uh, well, initials L of some kind in Chinese, uh, having a M in front of it, comes out as blah in uh, program form here. And actually, yeah, this is a, a place where, like, is that, you know, I would like to kind of know what the evidence for the B is. Uh, does it really need to be reconstructed? You know, and so on. Uh, but uh, but it's fine. You know, that kind of appendix is happening all the time. Um, so anyhow, this is a, a correspondence where uh, here they specify that we can tell it's an M, uh, probably because it's not from organic in um, in uh, Hmong Mian. I don't think they. They, they also have evidence of, let's say, nula, yeah, uh, so, which is, say, I think mean, all of the evidence of nasally things before L that comes from, where the evidence comes from, from Yen, is of M, but it's understandable why they feel confident to, uh, to specify that it's an M, because there's nothing 
particularly labial about uh, an L. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, that was it for Hmong Yan. And now we look at Krada uh, evidence. We're still, you know, in, as used by Vaccine Cigar. So pre initials in Latvia. So we have paper, which uh, is che in Middle Chinese. So we'll go back to te, uh, but because of this k in Latvia, they think that uh, there was k. Uh, and then bandit uh, similarly is chak, I guess, in uh, Latvia. So they think there was a k in all Chinese. And then, uh, and last but not least, needle. Uh, they think there's a T prefix because uh, there's a T in um, in Latvia. And actually, uh, this is one where uh, you would say, "Why don't we just reconstruct the old Chinese uh, back to T?" Yeah. Uh, and the the issue here is actually phase colonized very early in the history of Chinese. So, uh, so in certain conditions, uh, you can't tell the difference between an old Chinese K and an old Chinese T uh, on the evidence of um, middle Chinese alone. Uh, and probably because of the Shesham series, they're taking the, the Che back to a uh, Ke. Now here actually is a place where the date of the contact matters a lot, right? Because if, uh, if the K had already changed, it had already colorized before the contact, maybe this pen is just evidence of uh, what the Chinese sounded like at the time. Uh, and that we don't need to uh, pause this cluster. Yeah. So I think that's, there are things like that that we should you know, think about um, carefully. But uh, in any case, uh, this is what they propose. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, Proto Kra, they just have this one uh, example pillar uh, where Proto Kra has an M prefix, and so they put that M prefix into Old Chinese. Uh, right. and so for this pillar, you have there are two independent sources of evidence for the for the you know, so Kra and the uh, I'm going to say yes, although I've forgotten already what we had up there from Mom um, Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there were several stages, but maybe I'm confusing. Yeah, so I, I, I became an MD. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that I was giving, or, you know, earlier I was giving all the intermediate stages just to kind of make it the thinking clear, right? And now I'm just telescoping over that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you would have to, right? Because you have an D e in, uh, in middle Chinese. So you would, so, so, so you would reconstruct that back to a DR in Old Chinese. So then we have to say, well, that DR it's more yet, yeah, but doesn't fit Proto Kra. So yeah, that's going to be easy. Yeah. Uh, it gets quite some weight. These uh, these little guys, yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And well, and that's why I think they also need to be done like almost it would be nice if there were a monograph just on uh old chinese loans into neighboring languages right uh, of, the, of this type yeah uh because it is the sort of thing where like like i don't know how the proto pra was arrived at i don't know how the proto mong yan was arrived at so so it does you know yeah there's no reason that any of it actually feels fishy but sort of it ends up feeling kind of fishy <laughs> uh, in total because, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so now on to loan words not used by uh, backstream cigar. So this part should be, you know, in, in some ways more fun or more at least more fresh. Yeah, because if you, because if you've read backstream cigar's book and you said I need more loan words, <laughs> yeah, uh, then then here are some. Yeah, okay, so. Uh, first of all, some Indo Aryan loans in the old Chinese. And uh, I'm going to sort of, well, say there should be a paper coming about, out about this pretty soon, but it's been sort of in the oven a long, long time. Uh, and it's really Dieter Gunkel's uh, insight. It will be a paper with me 
uh, Dieter and Hannes Fellner, not in that order, yeah. Uh, but anyhow, so let's look at them. One is horse, where we think, and maybe you'll think we're crazy for this, that it comes from other ones, um, which, uh, well, I won't go through all the details, but uh, we, we think it comes from other ones. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, th and this is an example where, let's say, uh, I'm perfectly happy to move the R to the beginning again, right? Like, uh, like I've established a couple of days ago that I am perfectly, feel perfectly entitled to move around the R's. Uh, so it will make my R bond look better if, <laughs> if I can do it here, but I don't think it really matters. Uh, but I will say that like, for instance, uh, in, uh, in Tibetan, the one word for horse is Rmang. So this word for horse is kind of there throughout East Asia. Uh, this is what we, we propose in any case, and I will resist the urge to go into the details and just uh, have it whet your appetite for our forthcoming paper. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, oh yes, and I guess that, that this, let's say, if you believe, uh, I'm trying to get the kind of epistemological steps right, right? So if you believe that the loan is real, then that would allow us to specify the place of the R in old Chinese and change Baxter and Cigar's reconstruction. So that's what I'm going to be sort of focusing on in the discussion of these new loans is how do these new loan proposals affect their uh, reconstruction? Okay, so and then the other one is uh, is uh, the chariot word. So um, so uh, we think that comes from uh, chakra, uh, and that proposal has been around for a long time. I think it's I think Polly Blank made it. Uh, so and that uh, doesn't actually allow us to change the reconstruction, but uh, maybe it allows us to confer their reconstruction, something like that. May I ask why does Chinese pay with the aspirate and the And immediately pay. Yeah, okay. The yeah, you may ask. Yeah. I'm not going to answer that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the the you know, they didn't they didn't make that reconstruction looking at the inner area. Yeah. Uh, but our feeling is. Uh, their reconstruction is already close enough to the inner area to make it look quite plausible that that's its source. Uh, but then also, you know, uh, the, the chariot and the horse come together, right? And they come together in the archaeological record and they got them from inner area speakers. But, I mean, <laughs> basically, the, you know, in, in, in our view, I think I can say it that way, the, the, the archaeological evidence is overwhelmingly strong in this case. Of, of, of who they got the horse and chariot from. Uh, and then the chariot word looks just at face value really similar. Uh, and the horse word, I think uh, you, you have to, you know, be convinced by our discussion. I don't think that Arvant is, is obviously really similar to the Mont, but I think that it does work phonetically. Yeah. Um, okay, so now, uh, old Chinese lo loans into Tukarian. Uh, and uh, here I'm relying on uh, work of, of Hannes's. So uh, one is this word for 10,000, uh, which uh, Baxter and Cigar reconstruct as having a pre initial, but they are unable to specify which. Uh, but then if we look at uh, Tukarian, it's clear that the pre initial has to be a T. Yeah. So uh, so this is a loan from uh, Old Chinese into Tukarian. It also looks a lot like the uh, circuit one where it's called inside. Yes, and uh, we think that's also borrowed from Chinese. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and that's why it looks really similar. Yeah, uh, and uh, Hannes has an argument based on the, the historical chronology of, of, of Tukarian, why the Proto-Turkic word can't be the origin of the Dukarian word. Has to do with the vowels. Yeah. So um because I think it's tumun or something in, in you, uh, you, you, Yeah, you've got a vowel in there that we don't want, right? 
neither in Chinese nor in Tokyarian do we want that vowel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you probably need it because probably Proto Turkish can't say tmang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Oh, I just I just uh, said that. Yeah. So it allows us to specify that this pre initial was a T. Okay. Uh, next, there's this word paddy field, uh, which is ku in Tokarin and uh, lu in Old Chinese. And um, I, I think this can uh, allow us to propose a it would have to be a loose uh, pre-initial K because otherwise it would mess with the phonology. Uh, but uh, maybe the, the old Chinese had a K prefix. Yeah, I, it seems like you know it, the Bokarian and the Chinese forms are close enough that there there must be something going on here. But then also rice culture, you know, clearly I don't think it comes from the Turin Basin. Okay? Uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so anyhow, so that allows us again to, to, to add further specification to the old Chinese reconstruction. Okay. Uh, and then there's this, uh, this one. So last month of the year uh, or year end sacrifice. Now in this case, it looks actually like Tukarian is telling us that the extra um, consonants that Baxter and Cigar proposed, maybe shouldn't be there, you know, now, of course, that's not the end of the story, right? We would have to check why is it that Baxter and Cigar proposed the initial in this particular word, and personally, I would say if it's based on the Vietnamese, it's strong evidence. If it's based on Proto-Min, which I'm not discussing at all, uh, I think it's kind of weak evidence. Uh, and then also maybe Tokarian borrowed it after they'd already lost that consonant. You know, th there's a there's still it's not like uh, you know we're declaring victory and and we you know have destroyed their reconstruction or something like that. But I do think it's all these things you made with the old Chinese, of course, uh, uh, stick in stick into a layer that's actually too deep for some reason. Um, yeah, or over reconstructing something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean that 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 or I guess I'm saying there's two possibilities here. One is that uh they were right, there was a consonant there, but that consonant was not there by the time the loan uh came into Tokarian. Uh, and then the other option is that they're 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 seeing things. Yeah. Um yeah, or for some reason in this syllable. Some effect applies that is the same as yeah it had the pre initial but it's never happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I would say that that's a there's a, there's a concern or one way of putting what you're saying is there's a concern I think in 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 their approach that uh, it's too mechanical, right? You you see a phenomenon, you say this phenomenon is evidence of of this thing we reconstruct, so we will reconstruct it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, this word is reconstructed by uh, discussed by Federico. I, I will uh, I will send it to you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would I would love to. Yeah. Uh, of course, it would be very good for us to be able to do it. Can do Yeah. Is there a question? Sorry. No. Okay. Um, I mean, I let's say I I do think it's. There's no question that it's a loan from the Chinese, right? Because they're the meanings are too similar. Yeah. I'll check it. I think there's Iranian evidence, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Suggesting a different uh Edmond group. Yeah. Um well I think that's our last example of uh to carrying loans. Uh but now we and we get them going the other way. Now, these are, of course, late from an uh, old Chinese perspective. Uh, so don't expect any, you know, wild fire, 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 fireworks. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this is the most uh, exciting one that actually there's a, a, a talk online. So a talk that Honnitz gave in, in Ireland that uh, is on, online on my YouTube channel, uh, where actually he discussed all these examples in, in great detail, including the philology 
Uh, but anyhow, this is one where where in presenting it now, the details of his talk come to my mind. Yeah, uh, where uh, I think I'll just see what's on the next slide. Yeah, so Bastian Cigar reconstructed in this beautiful uh, diacritic filled way, right? Which means it, it could have an R or not. It, it, the, the development would be the same either way. Uh, and uh, we think it was a K, but maybe it wasn't. We think it was an A, but maybe it wasn't. We think it was a T, but maybe it wasn't. Yeah. So not very confident on their part. Yeah. But uh, it's uh, so it, it means a, a, a coarse woolen fabric. And uh, the Tocharians were the, the wool suppliers of the Chinese at this time. And, uh, and there is this uh, word in Tocharian uh, that means you know, coarse cloth. Uh, and it comes from uh, this, uh, its etymology actually is like scratchy or something in, in Tocharian, yeah. Uh, and in any case, the, the Tocharian, the first Tocharian, allows us to specify that we don't need all those uh, brackets and parentheses. In fact, it is cut. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then uh, honey, the honey word, uh, which there's a small secondary literature about, like, I mean, not emphasizing that it's small, it's actually large. You know, most, most of these words, there's no, there's no particular secondary literature about, but there's been a little bit of back and forth on the honey word. Uh, but in any event, yeah, the Chinese got honey from the Dokanans, and there you go. But in this case, it doesn't really affect the reconstruction. Well, so, like, uh, because some Slavic languages say including Turkish, like the word honey is like used. Yeah, it's the same it's word. The same. Yeah, it's the same word. Uh, I mean, it, in, in English, we have it as, as mead, right? Uh, oh. And uh, in Greek, it's Melly, yeah. And I mean, and uh, well, yeah. So I mean, this is the honey word in Indo-European. Yeah, the Indo-Europeans have honey, right? Did the Indo-Europeans have honey? Yeah. I think so. Right. Yeah, maybe not this word. But... Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be melody. Yeah. 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 In German, it's also made. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, right, where this is, mm, yeah, I don't know. But it becomes an Indo-European problem. Like, where's the L? Did, where did the Tocharian get this word from? Is it related to, the, to these other honey words? Yeah. All I care about right now is the Chinese well, got no, honey. Yeah. No, no, it's no problem here. Yeah. It's just like, is it better for, for the European to reconstruct the honey one than the honey two? Oh, or yeah. So we just reconstruct honey next to the E. Ah, okay, I see. I so see. Something happened uh, between probably European and, and Harry, but that's all. I see. Okay. Both from me to money. I see. I see. Uh, yeah, but so the Chinese got their honey from the Targaryens, and they also got their word for honey from the Targaryens. But, but like I said, it's not, I mean, this is really not a very exciting word uh, from a political from a perspective. I think some people have occasionally tried to stick an L into it in the history of Chinese, uh, but that's, it's the sort of thing that actually, I think now the increasing communication between, you know, uh, you and us, yeah, <laughs> helps us uh, avoid this kind of thing uh, when, it's, when it's avoidable, yeah. Okay, uh, and then uh, Asvatita, uh, it, uh, the Asvatita word, uh, and if you don't know what asvatita is, you're missing out because it's delicious. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, just the, it's a it's a it's it's like a powder. It comes from a plant, uh, and if you're especially if you're cooking Indian food, what you do is you put like three tablespoons of oil, get it really hot, and then drop some asvatita, just a pinch. It's really strong. It has a very strange flavor. This but it's delicious. Uh, yeah. too, because uh, this is from Cantonese, not, not from Italian. So the dating is. Uh, okay, well, let's talk. I, I'm not saying this thing. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's talk about this one uh, in some detail. Yeah. Because 
what am I doing here with this old Chinese? I'm not reconstructing the word for asphatida in old Chinese. Yeah, they didn't have asphatida in uh, 1250 BC. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm back projecting the old Chinese for these two characters. Yeah. So, uh, so it's like if they had had uh, uh, asphatida in 1250 BC, this is how they would have said it. But but it's but for instance, I think it's clear. But I think if you just allow me to pretend that the word existed in perfect Karen, and I'll let you and the Tocharians fight about that, the other Tocharians, uh, it's clear we need a vehicle here and not a U vehicle. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Yeah, um, pardon for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this would have probably been a uh, a vehicle already by the time of uh, the contacts happening. So, uh, so I think it might actually work. And, and, and I think one reason these sorts of things are important is not only to decide what to reconstruct in old Chinese, but, but when to reconstruct what, to kind of work out the actual absolute chronology of the phonological changes. changes. The, yeah. the S may also be in the orange, and maybe they just borrowed the final shirt as a for Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think that the, I was thinking that this final show was borrowed as this S. Yeah. But no, maybe. Yeah, the, the S is quite, the S stayed uh, into the Han Dynasty. So the S is around for a long time. The uvulars are definitely gone by the Han Dynasty, whereas the, the S is still around. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, I think there's, what we can certainly say, there's no question that. Uh, the Chinese borrowed Asafetida from, well, maybe from the Cognese, but, <laughs> but from the Cognese or from the Vicarians, yeah. Um, so what did I say here? Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So this, uh, I'm just, uh, this is a simpler issue than the uvular velar issue, so I focus on it. Uh, there's a change in the history of Chinese that probably happened in the Warring State period. Of Ui to, to Wei, so a kind of vowel breaking. And uh, this is evidence that we can date that vowel breaking to uh, after, sorry, to the, the, the vowel breaking would have had to happen in Chinese before the borrowing of uh, the word for asphatida in order for these two characters to have seemed suitable, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, and then uh, it also suggests that I had already changed to off, uh, which actually I think, I mean, let's say, I, I, or I want to be very careful about this. I think this comparison suggests that, but I actually think that uh, this I to off changed kind of between the Western Han and the Eastern Han. So it would be quite late actually for this borrowing. Uh, but, you know, I don't know how I thought I would mention it. Uh, and then also, uh, it confirmed, like in in some sense, uh, it, uh, it confirmed the nasal plus stop rather than just the straightforward nasal. So you know, if we start with this, what we imagine is at some point the qh changes into a kh, uh, and then uh, this would have been a velar nasal. But you see that in Middle Chinese, there's no evidence of the of the of the of the uvulus or the velar at all yeah so whenever this loan happened we think maybe you know or it would it would be the best fit maybe the right way to put it if uh, uh the chinese character was print was pronounced with a yeah a sort of pre-nasalized uh velar. uh okay and then this is just the citation for honest's presentation on this stuff uh okay so now some more loans. So I've already mentioned that uh, Sasuke uh, uh, Robin uh, thinks that uh, this, this word for a uh, some kind of you know, uh, barbarian military leader uh, comes from Proto Yenisean and confirms these uvulars. Uh, and it allows us to rule out the R in the second syllable if uh, if we believe it, right? And I think this 
Yeah. Is I don't know. I, I didn't read about it some time ago, and there, there was some back and forth whether this work even existed. And, and uh, I guess it's also regarded as the origin then for the, the Han uh, work. So I don't know exactly whether this proposal is still so much accepted, even more like Siberian in this case. Well, if it's the you know, let, let's just look at it in. I mean, from a Chinese perspective, as long as there are some barbarians around who are using uvulars in their word for, you know, um, for in, in their kind of Han word, then it's fine, right? I don't care if it's from Proto Mongolic or Proto Yenisean, right? As long as it's a uvular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he he probably had some reason to. He did, yeah. I mean, I'm... to put or posit this instead of the uh, uh, which has a lot of users in the right positions. But... Yeah, but for yeah. once it ends with an N. Yeah, yeah. Was maybe his reason. Yeah. Well, we can read his article, right? It's it's there. It's a while since I read this. So yeah. I mean, there are some problems, and I actually talked to him about it right after he published it because. Uh, like this S bothers me, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, well, and then here's the next one, uh, which is similar. So uh, we have all sorts of stuff. Um, and that's pretty good. Cool. Yeah, that looks great. Uh, and uh, it's, it, you know, it's the same character, right? So it also suggests that there was no R there. Uh, but actually, in, in this case, again, you don't have the end. But actually, in Turkey, ends come and go, right? Well, they can be multiple. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a singular or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyhow. Well, ends come and go over the world. Superior race. <laughs> the world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, except, actually, like the Afro Asiatic, this is something I've learned this week. The Afro-Asiatic genitive, which is just no, is extremely stable. Yeah. Is is about the the first mm -hmm. character. Um, is it means that when when uh when when this language borrow old Chinese, it and and we can find the evidence from it, then there then it then it shows that. They borrow the R, so it's okay to let the R be put into the old Chinese. Um, exactly. Sound. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Um. So it's it's sort of like um, if we can find a language that um back to the time really close to the old Chinese, then they have really close relations. Then we can um. Borrow that, then we can boldly guess that it is the sound of old Chinese. Yeah, I think the way I would put it, well, yeah, I'll tr I'll try and talk it through kind of quite uh, specifically, right? Uh, we know that the Tocharians had this word for wool. It was kratz. We know that the old Chinese had a word for wool that may have been kratz. It may have been kats. It may have been kats. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, there's reasons to think that uh, they're the same word, right? Because they mean the same thing in neighboring languages at the same time. But not only that, actually, I haven't gone into the philology. Uh, Hannes has. And for instance, in the show in Jezu, uh, it says about this character that it's a woolen fabric that comes from the West. Yeah. Uh, and and there's there's quite a lot of uh, uh, philological, circumstantial, or indeed archaeological evidence that uh, the Chinese were getting this particular thing, this this kind of particular commercial commodity from the Tocharians at that time. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of Chinese historical phonology, yeah, it allows us to specify that that R is indeed there, and that K is indeed a K. Yes, sir. And may I ask, have we looked at vowels so far? Because it's interesting to see that the Italian vowel corresponds to Chinese R, ah, I guess. I don't know if there's how many vowels Chinese have in general. 
Uh, so all Chinese have six vowels, so they would not have had a, an, an ah, ah distinction. I mean, yeah, 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 right. Um, but it, yeah. but we, haven't, we haven't talked about vowels. Vowels is something uh, I think we're not going to talk about, actually. The, I'm totally convinced by the six vowel hypothesis, but finding a clean way of presenting it, I have found extremely difficult. I have a, a video uh, online from the course I taught two years ago where I made my best effort at that point, uh, but I, I don't have anything better to do yet. So, so uh, uh, although uh, an, an MA student of mine actually has a paper coming out that maybe will help present uh, clearly the six vowel hypothesis. So what is the, uh, well, for the brackets doing around the uh, it's, the R is there. It's, uh, I think right. in this case it's saying it could have been an E, uh, but the, e is the, the English model. Eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in terms of their notation, right? What does a bracket mean? Bracket means kind of we softly propose it's this. So here we softly propose that it's a K, but it is. Uh, but we would not object. This is maybe where I would put it. To someone saying it's something else that leads to the same result in Middle Chinese. Yeah. And then the, the thing that is kind of you have to be on your toes about is then, you know, you as the reader have to know what are the other options that would lead to the same result in Middle Chinese in that syllable position. Yeah. yeah. I would actually, for outside, be more practical to have, I don't know, cross, cross, cross. Exactly. Yeah. Coma, coma, coma. yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, and you can actually like uh, for, for, for in a different context. Um, Shun Bong wrote a piece of software that does this for Proto Vermish, where it look it, it, it takes the attestations, looks at them, applies all the known historical phonology backwards, and then if there are eight possible reconstructions, it just spits out all eight. Yeah, and that uh, you know is costly maybe if you're printing these things out all the time. Uh, but, but but I think that explicitness is extremely helpful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, nobody has heard the proletariat that could well be more like an half hour than a half hour. No, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not a concept. It's not. I mean, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a. It's just a thin one. Oh yeah, it's not an. Uh, that was a. Uh, <laughs> okay. Certainly not. That was a strengthening not fly onset. Oh okay. So, yeah. Yeah. What are the six Chinese vowels that you put in? Uh, so they're, you know, A, E, E, O, U, and U. Uh. Ah, well. So they're the five canonical yeah. vowels and then uh, a schwa, if you like. Right. Yeah, it's pretty, it's a lovely system, I think, yeah.